Welcome back everyone. What's the science behind that is my name. And what is the history behind that is my game. Briefly here, viewer discretion is advised. Say everyone is indeed entitled to their own opinions regarding certain subjects. And all that I'm asking is you respect my opinion regarding certain subjects. Okay, so in today's video, I will be explaining where the dove found the olive branch after the flood. Many critics of the Genesis account scoff at the idea of plants and seeds lasting for an entire year in fresh and salt water, therefore discounting the biblical account of the Genesis flood, even though there is in fact a really simple explanation for all of this. Now keep in mind that even though Noah himself was at sea for about one year and ten days, the earth itself was not completely covered for an entire flood year, meaning the longest possible amount of time that seeds and our plants would have been in or underwater without any contact with land is roughly 278 days or about 9 months and 1 week. Now as a matter of fact, the period of time was possibly shorter since it would have taken many weeks for the entire earth to be completely covered, including all the high hills and mountains, and then some land would have been present just long enough for both plants and seeds to have grown and produced. So this time span could possibly shorten by a few months or so. Another assumption skeptics make is that species we have today are the same as at the time of the flood. Though some species were probably around then, such as the Walmite pine, it is safe to assume that most species around today are not exactly the same as what was around during the time of the flood, roughly some 5,000 years ago. Now we have to remember that aside from the flood, plants have undergone roughly 5,000 years of speciation, mutation, and even genetic deterioration. This means that some of the genetic information has been lost over time. Although many would consider the species today as to be delicate as the species some 5,000 years ago. The fact is that those same species could have been more genetically and physically robust and thus able to withstand extreme conditions than modern plants, including, for example, up to, say, nine months in Marshall floodwaters. Skeptics also have a tendency to ignore the fact that there are, in fact, trees today, as well as several plant species, that actually thrive in flood-like conditions or even salt water. For example, we have mangroves, which live primarily along tropical coastlines, and not to mention the flowering plants and trees that flourish in swamplands. Some trees that live in swamplands include, but are not limited to, for example, the white cedar, eastern hemlock, lobelly pine, black spruce, red maple, elm, pine, oak, and birch. Knowing that some trees withstand saturating water conditions makes it difficult to say quote, unquote, plants could not survive in floodwaters for an entire year. Because, for example, these trees I just mentioned are literally thriving in such conditions. Now, the answer to our question starts with one simple word, dendrochronology. Of what importance does dendrochronology have to the flood story? I won't go too far into this topic, but I will say that several species of trees live almost indefinitely. For example, the giant sequoia trees of California are known to live well over 3,000 years, discerning through what is known as tree ring dating. Now, under normal circumstances, tree growth, uh, one tree ring per year, and typically consists of a light-colored growth portion and a dark-colored growth portion that is produced in a stabilized season. However, some trees do not produce annual tree rings, especially those, and get this, in both tropical and temperate regions. Overlapping correlating rings have been used to produce chronology of past years. Linear sequences of rings are obtained by cross-matching tree ring patterns from both living trees and those from older deadwood. For example, a well-known study which involves the bristlecone pine trees of California's White Mountains and others have been employed, like for example, the oak trees in South Germany or possibly the point trees of Northern Ireland. Most chronologies usually go back a few centuries. However, a few trees also gives a longer age than the Bible seems to allow, as high as 10,000 years or older. So how do we solve the problem? Firstly, I just want to say that the correct age of the earth, biblically speaking that is, is actually far older than 6,000 years old. Now when we use the human chronology, we are placed roughly around 8,000 years. And when we apply the age theory, for example, we get roughly between 15 to 20,000 years. So I'll make a video on this shortly, please stay tuned until then. And secondly, a lot can affect a tree ring growth such as insects, disease, a day's length, the amount of sunshine, water potential, nutrients, the age of the tree, temperatures, rainfall, 
height above the ground, the proximity of a branch, or even fire damage, for example. Each of these can all impact and interrupt the normal tree growth cycle. Now, by assuming the outer ring records the most recent year and that each ring signals one year, a researcher can determine a date based on a particular ring. So far, based on the given information, we now know that tree rings can grow multiple rings in a single year. We also know that a number of things can affect the growth cycle. Here is a question. How valid is the assumption of one ring per year in a climate where tree growing conditions are variable? Hint, hint. This is where our solution to our problem comes in. That very assumption is regularly put to the test by research foresters. They investigate how trees grow, how and when it adds a new ring, the effects of nutrients, rainfall, etc., etc., and even a range of other related conditions. It has been found that all trees, even slow-growing ones, respond dynamically to the tiniest environmental changes. Even hourly changes in growing conditions. Scientists have also observed that under normal conditions, trees can produce more than one ring per year, or sometimes even no rings at all. Scientists have also concluded that weather was most likely the guilty culprit. The point of this is that unusual storms, i.e. a worldwide flood, with an abundant rainfall, interspersed with dry periods could in fact produce multiple rings. As dendrochronology pertains to our flood model considerations, Remember that for centuries immediately following the flood, we witnessed the coming of the Great Ice Age. With the recently sprouted and actively growing trees, the warm oceans, rapidly evaporating, this would provide the raw materials for major monsoon-like storms. The Earth would basically be covered in frequent and wide-ranging atmospheric disturbances, dumping massive snowfall in the northern region and rain in the south. If there was ever a time where there would be multiple tree rings developing, then this was it. The tree ring growth was probably anything but annual. And this is how Christians alike can use dendrochronology to their advantage in order to both explain the survival of pre-flood plants and prove there really was a global flood. Remember, the blood explicitly teaches that the Great Flood covered the entire globe. Its primary purpose was to judge the sinful civilization of Noah's day, Genesis 6-7, but the judgment extended to the animals and even the earth. 722 to 19. The pre flood vegetation is not specifically mentioned, but no doubt the water devastated all land plants, trees, crops, forests, and swamps. So, what happened to the remains? That is a very good question. Now, obviously, some plants were buried in flood sediments and were fossilized. However, petrified trees are found in certain layers of flood deposit cemetery rocks worldwide. Often one finds fossilized twigs or leaves or fern impressions, but these are fairly rare. Evidently, the majority of plants didn't get fossilized, so where are the rest? Now, some interesting factors that may help us in determining how plants survive the flood is by looking at coal. Coal deposits have long been identified as the altered remains of vegetation. The volume of coal in its discovery, yes, even in polar regions, still gives us a picture of a lush vegetation in a pre-flood world quite differently from our own. There is still evidence that the trees typically fossilize, for example, carboniferous coal, scenes which may have even grown as nearshore floating islands, if you will, with extensive shallow root systems, which may become floating mats of vegetation during the flood. Now once buried, they would then metamorphose into coal. Some mats must have been unthinkably large, far larger than any modern peat swamp, for the coals they left behind in some cases covered entire states. Now the concept of floating log mats has become a powerful one in flood geology. Some geologic strata are identified as the presence of wood fragments, giving the impression that the mat was floating in shallow water with its underside abrading on the surface below. However, there are also many rock layers which seem to require calm water for deposition. A floating mat would certainly have had a damping effect on even turbulent flood waters, calming them at least locally for periods of time, allowing deposition of these sediments. These mats may have been a temporary haven during a cataclysmic storm for various animals, helping them survive for weeks or even months before finally being overwhelmed. Floating vegetation would also have been the place insects could have survived, particularly in their eggs and larva stages, ensuring that they would be distributed worldwide to facilitate regrowth and pollination of plants and seeds, springs and spores once the flood was over.
In other news, let's consider several other hypothetical possibilities for how plants and seeds survived after the flood. Many of these possibilities have in fact been documented. Plants would have been taken onto the ark as food for Noah, his family, and the animals. Genesis 6.21 Some of these plants could have been cereal plants which are found to unable survive a long time in American floodwaters. Some of these plants were replanted by Noah and his family after the flood, since we are specifically told he planted a vineyard after the flood. Genesis 9.20 Now keep in mind that after leaving the ark, any seeds and plants the animals ingested during their final days in the ark could have passed through them and then left on the ground in their excrement. Yes, sadly to say, this sort of germination does in fact exist. Many planted seeds could have survived on vegetation mats of floating debris. Floating vegetation could have contained many uprooted trees and other plants that could have survived and then regrown once the floodwaters receded. Think, for example, water sprouts. The olive branch and many other trees and plants are propagated even today by asexual budding from planted cuttings. So some seeds could have survived in this sort of debris and their root systems just as Charles Darwin observed. Quote, unquote. Out of one small portion of the earth thus completely enclosed in by the roots of an oak about 50 years old, three to cuddle it on as plants germinated. Many herbivorous animals certainly died in the flood and their carcasses certainly could have floated as carrion on the surface of the waters, holding and even protecting seeds in their body. Once again, Darwin made an astute observation, quote unquote again. Again, I can show that the carcasses of birds when floating on the sea sometimes escape being immediately devoured, and many kinds of seeds in the crops of floating birds retain the vitality. But some taken out of the crop of a pigeon, for example, which had been floating artificial seawater for nearly 30 days, to my surprise, nearly all germinated. There is no doubt that plants survived the flood. This means by which they survived are numerous, but only a few examples are given here. So the skeptics claim that plants could not have survived the flood for an entire flood year is without warrant. Furthermore, by making this claim, they inevitably invalidate some of the studies of Charles Darwin himself. Now think about that for a moment. I would also like to point out that the recolonization of flooded ground was studied after the Yorkshire flood of 1968. Partially rotting clumps of annual meadow grass left on the strand line recolonized areas of cinnamon seeds also germinated from the flood debris and also from soil which had been immersed from various lengths of time. Now in some cases the seedlings became established in apparently hospitable sandy sediments containing little water or nutrients. Examples of the first plants to colonize the area were that of coltsfoot, small stinging nettle, silverweed, chickweed, horsetail, shepherd's purse, and even tormentil. Although this example from Yorkshire was in fact a flood of short duration, it does demonstrate the ability of some plants to survive and also colonize impoverished grounds. However, the plants that I just mentioned would basically act like a sponge to retain water, and some encourage plants less tolerant of dry conditions to colonize the same ground subsequently. Now another example would be the colonization of volcanic rocks on Krakatoa after the 1883 eruption, which also demonstrates how readily plants can grow on grounds which is very different from mature soil. For example, after 14 years, 50 species of vascular plants were found. These had presumably been transported from neighboring islands. After 25 years, the ground was completely covered by plant life. By 1971, Roughly 83 vascular plants had become established, originating mainly from neighboring islands through seed dispersal by either wind or water. The plant colonies gradually advanced inland and at the same time, nutrient-fixing bacteria and also mosses had begun to colonize the inland lava flow. Now the speed of revegetation on the Earth's surface after the flood similarly would be dependent largely on the temperature and the abundance of seeds or other plant parts which were still viable. Rotting debris by providing a source of nutrients and a store of water would increase the rate of establishment of vegetation. We do know that 120 days after the ark had grounded, leafy shoots was already sprouted as the dove found an olive leaf on the second occasion it was released from the ark. Now it is certainly interesting to note that animals were not released from the ark until 93 days had elapsed after the olive leaf was brought back by the dove. The vegetation at this point would have grown during the period which would have become sufficiently established to survive trampling and provide grazing for the animals when released from the ark.
Now here's another thing we should all take a look at. How did the plants adapt to the changing conditions after the flood? So you see, the evaporation of the flood waters by the winter fruit to in Genesis 8 would have caused considerable cooling to the surface of the earth, and probably a major contributory factor in the formation of the ice caps at both poles, as well as the ensuing Pleistocene glaciation in the northern hemisphere. The subsequent retreat of the ice caps was coupled with decreased rainfall in some tropical areas and was probably responsible for the formation of the desert regions of some of the world which are still increasing in the area at present time. The most famous example is the Sahara Desert, which is known to have supported grassland and vegetation as well as several species of Mediterranean wilderness plants up until roughly 4000 BC. Now this was done according to the results of pollen analysis of materials from both Tibetsi and Hagar Massifs. However, by about 2000 BC, archaeological finds indicate that people were moving out of the region, and similar evidence from the Pacific Southwestern deserts in North America shows that the area once supported mixed arable farming of corn, beans, and squash. Now changes in the world climate shortly after the flood obviously would have had a profound effect on the vegetation types of the world. The plants which initially colonized an area as the flood waters drained away would not necessarily have been suited for both climate and soil conditions which developed and presumably many became extinct especially in less hospital environments. However, the genetic variation between individuals of the same plant species have a certain amount of elasticity, for example, and the tolerance limits to colder or drier conditions. One present day example is the tolerance of plants to air pollution from industrial societies. Strands of ryegrass tolerance to pollution by acid grasses have been found downwind of prevailing southwesterly airstream passing over the industrial northwest of England. Now similarly, strains of bent grass growing on mine waste at the old Drazi Code Copper Mine in North Wales were found to be tolerant to this heavy metal selection of individuals for a particular characteristic. Now for example, early flowering in Kent strains of perennial ryegrass or cold tolerance in Coxfoot, which can occur within relatively few generations. Also, tolerance to air pollution by sulfur dioxide was found in populations of perennial ryegrass after three or four generations. The process by which tolerance strains develop is a relatively simple one and involves competitive advantage in growth and reproduction. When exposed to the different environmental changes, the tolerant individuals are those which grow more vigorously and eventually will take on a greater proportion of the available light, nutrients, and water. Now by such competition, the sensitive individuals which are growing more slowly and producing less speed will in fact contribute less to each succeeding generation until eventually they are eliminated. Another process which enhances adaptation to change environmental conditions is the switching on or switching off part of the genetic material and this can alter the characteristics of the plant studies in which the local populations of Achillea were transplanted to other environments along an east-west transect across central California, which basically showed that each population only had a uniform growth habit in its original environment. The different plant forms and growth habits at other sites led the author to suggest that another set of genes was operating. Alternatively, the interaction between the gene material and the environmental conditions could have affected gene expression. Furthermore, an even greater divergence of plant structure was seen amongst the offspring, notably in the second generation. Now, in the changes of the post-flood environment, those plants less able to adapt to changes in environmental conditions would be gradually eliminated. Whereas, those species with particular strains capable of tolerating the new conditions would predominate. It would be predicted from the mechanisms of selection described above that the greatest abundance of different plants would be found growing in the post-flood climates, most nearly approaching those which predominate before the flood. Now conversely, where there is only a limited variety of plant life, it can be assumed that the climates had diverged the most from the pre-flood environments and the plant life represented is that which possesses the potential to adapt to these new conditions. Now in general, the greatest variety of plant life is found in subtropical and tropical areas with abundant rainfall and examples of the harsh environments with few types of plants which would be desert, arctic, and alpine areas. And then there's recolonization. This would have occurred in all areas where there was sufficient water and nutrients to sustain plant life. Climate changes occurring after the flood would have restricted the distribution of many plants. Even tolerant strains of some species would colonize the less favorable climate areas to give distinctive floras. 
For example, we have Desert, Arctic, and Appalachian Plant Associations. Now, the selection of such tolerant strains can occur within a few generations, and this would have prevented many species from becoming extinct. Now, I personally believe that the problem of plant survival during the worldwide flood in the time of Noah, Genesis 6 through 8, as well as the problem of subsequent reestablishment of both natural vegetation and agriculture crops, is one that is often overlooked. The present distribution of natural vegetation is partly due to the relatively random distribution of plant debris by the receding floodwaters and partly as a result of the differences in environmental tolerances of the recolonizing species, adaptation to the different post-flood climate occurs in some groups of plants while others were restricted to environments more nearly approaching pre-flood conditions. Now please keep in mind that agriculture was first reestablished in the Near East, close to the area of the Arad mountain range where the Ark was grounded. During subsequent migrations of agricultural peoples, some of these crops became adapted to different climatic conditions, while others which did not possess the genetic variability to form viable populations were replaced either by plants which had been weeds of the original crop, or by domesticated indigenous species which gave better yields. Sadly, there is little archaeological evidence from which we can trace the movement of post-flood agriculture. However, the information that is available does not conflict with the hypothesis based on the Genesis account that present-day agriculture originated from a single source in the Near East. In conclusion, it is perfectly reasonable to suggest that plant life survived the Noachian flood, either in the ark, in the floodwaters, or buried in the uppermost sediments deposited at the time. Naturally occurring mechanisms such as seed and bud dormancy can account for the survival of these plants. Recolonization of the land surface devoid of soil with less hospital environment conditions can also be understood in terms of the process of natural selection. However, not all types of plants would have survived, and the present continents carry only the impoverished range of the original diversity of plant life which flourished before this cataclysmic event. Well, that is pretty much all I really wanted to say for this topic. If any further questions and comments, please let me know below. And until next time, ciao everyone.